is the holy is it living in temples and shrines does it shine down from the heavens does it well up from the planet reach out from inside where does sacred reside a good theologian is one who says almost nothing about God, even though the word theology means discourse about God. It is risky to talk about God. The notion of God might be an obstacle for us to touch God as love, wisdom, and mindfulness. I welcome you to this program that is entitled, My Karma Ran Over My Dogma. I am Reverend Sandra Whippy, and I bring you this program because I am quite uh, dedicated to helping people understand the rights and responsibilities of religious freedom. For generations, people have kind of divided and subdivided religious points of view until sometimes we're actually looking at other churches or religious groups as the other. In a country such as ours that has religious freedom, we have not only rights but responsibilities to respect other people's religious points of view. I am presently with this program and for the next three programs that I will be producing. I'm going to show you examples of how religious groups can work together. I think that's one of the most exciting parts of a country where there is great diversity. So today we're going to talk about a breakfast program here in the Monadnock community a breakfast program that actually is being supported and run by people of many different religious perspectives. I will introduce you to someone from the Interfaith Clergy Association, and that person will then introduce the other people on our panel. And through that experience, I hope that not only will you know more about the breakfast program that they're running together. But you also will be inspired to see this as an example of a place where people who have different religious experiences and different religious points of view can work together not only to act out their own faith stories, but also to learn more about people who attend other churches. So first, Reverend Michael Hall from the Unitarian Universalist Church here on Washington Street in Keene will speak to you and tell you a little bit more about how he became involved in this program. Thank you, Sandra, and thanks for having us this morning. Um, I'm very excited to talk about the Community Breakfast Program, which began as a lay effort in, in our church, sponsoring one day a week of hot meals in the morning for folks who are homeless and coming to us from the 109th shelter as well as others in the community who need to have a warm breakfast to begin their day. Um, it expanded in the first year that I was here to, to two days uh, sponsored by KUUC and our lay leaders thought that you, we're, the, we're the poor are hungry every day and where those who are struggling to keep a job and living in their car and, and may not have the, the financial wherewithal uh, to eat three warm meals a day could come to our uh, church. But if we could get other churches involved uh, through the Interfaith Clergy Association, then we could really make an impact. And, and our goal has been since that time to, to provide hot meals six days a week and then uh, on Sunday, the community kitchen does a brunch uh, for folks. And so all seven days of breakfast would be covered. Um, so I was asked to bring it to the Keene Interfaith Clergy Association, a, a collegial group of a clergy in the town, and, and did so. And immediately there was a great response from 
the United Church of Christ, and, and from uh, a consortium of Roman Catholic uh, uh, church, uh, church groups, uh, including people from St. Bernard's and St. Margaret Mary, Catholic Charities, and especially the Knights of Columbus. So mm -hmm. um, in the end, although uh, clergy have, have, have been involved in helping to expand the effort, it really was a, a lay idea, a, a, you know, just people, congregants, wanting to live their religion, not just talk about it or think about it or be preached to about it. Mm -hmm. um, that that they, uh, they were the ones who had the ideas to expand things and to, and to help coordinate with the different religious bodies. We made a decision early as well to have the, the breakfast at the Unitarian Universalist Church so there'd be no confusion for the people who'd be attending. Which mm -hmm. day do I go to what church? And, um, and of course, not to proselytize. It isn't about, um, you know, trying to convert anyone. Mm -hmm. It's about being able to feed people and give them a warm place to stay early in the mornings in the winter months. Mm -hmm. Started during the time of the 100 Night Shelter, which this year we're expanding from December 1st through the 3rd of, of April. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and just for a little statistics, last year uh, we had four uh, breakfasts a week and we served 1,600 and, and uh, excuse me, 1,068 meals wow. over the course of the winter, averaging about 30 people uh, coming to take part in the breakfast every morning. 30 people average. 30 people, yes. And to be fed. Right, mm -hmm. right. And so, you know, without further ado, let me introduce some of the wonderful lay people who have been involved not only putting on the breakfast, but engaging with the people that we serve. And um, that social interaction with the people who are eating the breakfast right. is as nourishing for them and for their soul as the food that we're serving for them. Absolutely, and it's so. as important to the spiritual uh, life and faith formation of all the people who are involved as well, and I think they find that that being there, living their faith, and and, and engaging with people is as nourishing and rewarding perhaps as it may be for the people who are being served. Okay, would you interview or um, introduce the people that are here to do this? I certainly will. Uh, first, uh, to my immediate right, is Charlie Gibson, who's a, a communicant at St. Bernard's Parish, mm -hmm. but also in some ways is representing the other uh, Roman Catholic groups that I mentioned. Um, Beside Charlie is Dan York, uh, a lay leader, past president of the Keene Unitarian Universalist Church, who uh, not only took part in the breakfast, but also his whole family, his wife and, and two lovely daughters, took part in, in one of the days that we sponsored. And Marsha Winter, who's, who's coming to us from the United Church of Christ, and is it the Mission Council or the? Um, social and Mission Action. Uh, Something of that sort. Right. I don't remember the name of the committee. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, and, yes. and once we get to the breakfast, the committees themselves aren't important, and it just uh -huh. becomes about us and the people. So, um, you know, I would be glad to just turn it over to these folks and, and mm -hmm. have them talk a little bit about their church's involvement and their personal involvement. Okay. Charlie, would you like to go first? Um, well, I'm, I'd rather not, but I will. <laughs> 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 um, Yes, I'm Charlie Gibson, and I'm, uh, I go to St. Uh, Bernard's Church. Uh, I've been involved with um, social action forever. I mean, it's one of, I was reading the other day, somebody said that social act, the church without social action is like Christ without miracles. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know if it's that, that, that much difference, but, but it is, they of, oftentimes they talk about Catholic social teaching as a secret best hidden. I mean, the best hidden secret of Catholicism. Mm -hmm. And it's a shame that that is, that's a reality. And the church has, church has always been involved with the poor. And Pope Francis has really ramped that up a great deal and talks about the church. He wants a church that's poor. And he's basically saying, and, and as well as the Second Vatican Council talked about the preferential option for the poor. And basically that, you know, that if we throw our hat in with the poor, 
if we're in solidarity with the poor, we'll look at the world very differently. And the kingdom of God would be on a, a more of a reality than it is today here on earth because there would be compassion and justice and, and a sympathy and understanding. And that is, that's the church of the poor, that one looks at from, the, from those that are dispossessed, as Jesus himself was poor, utterly poor, walked amongst the poor. And it's hard for us to really go back and, 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 and grab a hold of that, because we have come through the church that was triumphal and, and powerful. And, and so, but that's not the original, that's not where, it, that's not the roots. And that's, I think, in a lot of ways, our downfall. And I think Pope Francis, when he talks about church of the poor, go out and smell the, be with the, be with the sheep, you know? And that's, that's basically go out and be with people, rub shoulders with those people at the, at the Unitarian Church breakfast. I'd like to speak to that just a moment, Charlie, because when uh, your present pope was speaking publicly about that issue, uh, for the first time that it really made a lot of news broadcasts repeating his words about speaking up for those who were disadvantaged. And I was in my car at the time that this was being brought up on a news broadcast, but I was on my way to a meeting with several other friends of mine that uh, included a couple of Catholic gals that are very close to my heart, but aware that I am a Unitarian Universalist. And when I got to the meeting, I walked in and I said, I'm a Catholic today. So it helps us to feel that unity with one another. Yes. So Dan, do you want to tell us about why you are involved in this? Sure. Maybe it first might help to understand a bit about how the Unitarian Universalist Church here in Keene got or is involved in things. And maybe to back up a step for those just watching, uh, the Unitarian Universalist Church is a bit different than other churches that people might be familiar with in that to be a member, you don't have to join and believe in a certain kind of creed or a certain kind of uh, belief system. And, and in truth, and this sometimes people find hard to believe, is that you don't even have to believe in God to become to be part of our community. We are a, a group that um, welcomes people from all different types of religions. And so we have people who are Christian, uh, Jew, um, Hindu, Buddhist, pagan, and we do have people who are atheist, agnostic, and or just don't have any kind of um, religious background. Out of that, you, you start to say, well, well, what do you do? What do you believe in? What do you work on? How do you, how do, you do this? And what unites us really is, uh, it partly is the choice that we come together to work and to be in a spiritual community. And, and part of it is this desire to serve, as Charlie talked about, the social action component, the piece of that. And so we have a saying in our, in our church around uh, love is the doctrine of our church and service is its prayer. And so part of our focus is around how do we help serve uh, the people in our community, the people in our region. And, and so our, our social action council has been very involved for many years in a lot of different social action activities and, and pieces. And our church in the last year or two has really focused a lot on economic injustice issues and, and ways that we can look at how do we make it a more fair and equitable world in general. And so the, the community breakfasts were certainly part of the activities they were originally working on. And I, and I should say, it too, um, I'm sitting here talking about this, but my involvement has been as a participant. There were certainly other people within our, our organization and church who have been involved as leading it and creating, the, you know, being involved with this. I, was, I joined in last year as part of that. So that's a bit about why I think our church got involved, was looking at how do we truly help the people in this region who need help. What's a very tangible way that we can go out and, and do that? And I think these community breakfasts are, are a large part of that. I, I would say individually, or as a person, personally, uh, it was very rewarding for me on a, on a whole number of levels. Um, part of it was, you know, that chance to actually be of service, uh, you know, to, to do works of, of good uh, effort that are helping in some way that is really real. 
you know, you, you, you know when that person walks in there um, that you're helping them. You know, you can, you can see that it's, it's, they need this. It's a very tangible way to do that when so often we talk about matters of, uh, you know, social action in a larger global context of transforming the world in various different ways. But a lot of that is much higher at a global level that we can't see the immediate impacts of what we do. I'd like to just say for a moment, the thing that's coming to my mind is that phrase that most of us have heard, that the devil is in the details. Mm -hmm. And so often our theological differences separate us when here we are joined because we share a community concern. So I think that that teaches each of us that this concept of learning to love one another is really lived out in this program. And do you want to talk to us a little, Masha, about what brings you to work with us? So um, we have an assistant minister. His name is Chris Cornell. And Chris, I think, has challenged the church in some very beautiful ways. Um, he has taken a lot of energy and put it towards 100 Nights Shelter and the homeless. Um, spent a lot of time getting to know the people that are having the hardest times in our area. And he's brought that back and shared that with the rest of us. And I, I feel like he has really inspired me personally on this journey. Um, I was a part of the committee, even though I can't remember the name of it. We combined two, and so I have no idea what the name of the committee is now. It's usually the but <laughs> mission. Well, it's, mission a, it's committee. got a couple, yeah, something of the sort. But anyway, um, so I was a part of that committee when it was brought to our committee, and I, I was quite interested in um, stepping out. I, I feel like a lot of times we have a tendency to put ourselves on the other side of the street. You know, it's almost mm -hmm. uncomfortable, really, to look at the position that these people are in. And, um, and Chris has inspired me to say, no, let's look at where these people are. Mm -hmm. Let's get to know these people. They are people. They are human beings. They are human beings. And so I actually, the group that came to the um, UU Church to do the breakfast from the UCC. Um, you know, we all learned how to do the breakfast part, but they said, we need a volunteer that will go out and sit with them. Oh. And I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so I went out and I, I've actually sat and gotten to know them and shared their stories. And I think one of the things that, that I felt for myself is that I felt like there were times in my life where I could have been just like so close to actually losing it if I didn't, you know, and becoming homeless if I didn't have some kind of a safety net. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, I had a safety net. And so when I think of that, it's so much easier to just really say, that could be me. Mm -hmm. What would I want? How would I feel? And, mm -hmm. you know, so sitting down and, and, talking to them, getting to know where they are, who they are. I find that has been really valuable to me um, and to the point where, you know, at the end of last year, I was giving people hugs when we were saying goodbye and sending them on their way, and it felt right. It felt good. Yeah, I think that was one of the more powerful pieces for me was, because I, too, would go out and sit down with them, because at some point, too, once you got the mechanics down of doing the breakfast and doing that, you know, it was going out there and hearing their stories and, and listening to the stories and, and understanding. And, you know, and yeah, there but, you know, because of a few paychecks, you know, could be me. And you talk to some of the folks, and, and you realize some of them have made choices and made poor choices, and some of them continue. And, they'll, and some of them are honest and will admit they're continuing to make poor choices. Yes. Others of them had situations, you know, there were a number of people who came through who were, tra who were transient workers. Mm -hmm. They'd come through or, you know, in one case, a guy had come up to help out his brother and his brother had gotten sick. And, this, you know, the story goes on and, and then you, you find that, um, that here they are. They have nothing to do and, they're, they're, you know, this is helping them. And there were a couple that, you know, got, you know, we were able to kind of see their, their ev uh, evolution into having jobs and being out there. But the other powerful point you raised, too, was breaking that wall between... <clears throat> The, the us and them, 
because you know my wife, uh, as Reverend Michael mentioned, my wife and daughters joined us, and 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 we were all doing this. My wife actually more than me sometimes, but one of the things she found powerful was that she came to know the names of some of the people in the community. So when she was walking down and she saw them at, you know, Railroad Square, she knew their name. She could talk to them. They weren't just the other. They were somebody there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and that was a powerful aspect, I think, to, to start to understand those stories and to realize that, yeah, they might be that person who it may not look too, may look a little shady or something, and they're over there, but they're, they're okay. They are a real person, and they're, they have a story that's there, and they have a name, and mm -hmm. they want to be loved in some level. Right, and I think too often they feel discarded. Mm -hmm. They feel discarded. The phrase that's coming to my mind that is from very long ago, there but for the grace of God go I. Yeah. That's a phrase that we don't often hear today, but the thought is exactly what we're all speaking. There but for the grace of God go I. And so we sit here, someone spoke a few minutes uh, before we started this program, that we are all Christian and we are all white, and, and yet this community is a very diverse community. And it wasn't too many years ago that the Keen Sentinel wrote their article about the people who lived in the woods behind the grocery store on West Street. And I was actually shocked. I was not aware that there was, was a community of people, a little, uh, a little town of unadvantaged, disadvantaged people who were living out the winter behind the grocery store. Well, and that kind of has led more to 100 Nights Shelter, and although I think the community kitchen is a lot older than that, this breakfast program is an offshoot of our concern. And we have developed more recognition for their existence among us, just as we are more diverse. Right. And I can't say enough about the importance of our getting out of our sanctuaries yeah. and and not just listening about our religion but living it and and that social action is probably a misnomer because for it to be effective it has to be social engagement, engagement. it has to be face to face mm -hmm. and and the beautiful thing about the community breakfast program is you know a lot of the folks that come are coming from the 100 nights shelter which i understand is the only non-dry shelter in the state of New Hampshire, which means if you behave well, but you are, uh, you, know, you are under the influence of alcohol or something, you still have a warm place to stay mm. in the coldest nights. And, and you know, it, it, as part of that, when, when we are engaging with folks at the breakfast, there, there, are, there are people in various states, um, and, and we have to embrace and engage and, and find a way to uh, support those folks. Um, and it really is in acts of kindness. It really is in, in compassionate, deep listening, like Dan was talking about, going out and, and getting, getting to a place of, of informality where a hug is appropriate as, mm -hmm. uh, you know, those type of things. It's a, it's a just plain folks program. You know, we, we're just there as people of faith trying to do something. And one of the things I think it was Marsha mentioned is that uh, uh, several years ago I heard uh, Unitarian Universalist Service Committee uh, President uh, William Schultz preach. And he was talking about, uh, his sermon was called Blood, uh, Bread and Roses. It was, about, it, it, it was referencing the 1912 uh, garment workers strike and, mm -hmm. and they came back with bread and roses and one of the things he was saying was so important is it's not just about the bread it's about having yeah. beauty in our life having engagement having joy having people that are happy to see us every morning feeling and, loved right feeling and, wanted yes and feeling and, comforted feeling comforted feeling people comforted you when you aren't there right yes you know because yes. if somebody wouldn't come I'm like well where is so and so you know mm -hmm. yes yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. And to your point about the the place behind the shopping center, sir. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, one of the interesting 
aspects, I guess, was to, for me, was to realize the extent of the homeless issue uh, of, of the space in here, because we talked to some of those folks who were living in those same camps that were talked about, mm -hmm. because some of them, you know, some of them were, a lot of them came from 100 nights, but others of them sometimes had issues and weren't able to stay at 100 nights, mm -hmm. or they had other kinds of, you know, reasons why they were in other places. And so to hear them and to learn about some of the other places they went was, uh, was quite interesting to find out where they go. Do they you know, have to be checked in in any way for the breakfast program? breakfast program? I mean, no. does someone stand at the door to be sure they're qualified? Right. Or no. do you welcome all that We come? don't check any resumes, nothing. Yeah. <laughs> just come on in and, and, uh, and you know, we, we try to uh, make a nice inviting place in, in our parish hall mm -hmm. and, uh, and keep people there and, and in community for as long as they're at the breakfast. Um, uh, for a lot of people, they appreciate just the warm cup of coffee mm -hmm. in those hours before other places that they would go um, are open, you know, the library or something like that. So, um, mm -hmm. and, it, and it's really important. We serve a warm, full breakfast. You know, there's scrambled eggs, there's oatmeal prepared by human beings in the kitchen. They're served on, you know, plates. Uh, yes. It's not, you know, uh, disposable stuff and plastic forks and knives. It's It's real silverware and, mm -hmm. and, and plates, and I think that helps to make it more homey. And you know what I think is really neat is that what you see is, okay, we're going to all this effort to, you know, get this breakfast on, but at the end of it, they take a lot of effort to yeah. clean it up, yeah. to put the yes. tables away, put the chairs away, just to really get it back to where it was. Yeah. You know, they really mm -hmm. appreciate it, yeah, and they do their part. There's certainly a, you know, a good number who you know, are, are grateful, and it's, it's nice. You know, I, I think as a volunteer providing that, too, to, to you know, hear their expressions of gratitude, and to know that in some small way you've helped brighten up their day mm -hmm. you know, just by providing this. And, and in many cases, this may be the only warm meal they might have that particular day or for a period of time. And so you know, for that brief hour, you know, they've had some kind of nourishment and rest and, and um, you know it's and I go back to you know this I think from a personal as a volunteer it's it's been good to have my own um, expectations my own my own um, boundaries pushed I guess you'd say or pushed a bit out of my comfort zone in interacting with people that I would not normally interact with mm -hmm. you know and as Reverend Michael mentioned there have been times when people have come that have been under the influence or been other things and you know it's brought about some interesting you know, personal experiences to try to understand how you interact in some of those cases. But mm -hmm. the stories have been, you know, interesting to talk to them to and learn about, you know, yeah, as you said there, but for the grace of God go I. Yeah. Uh, the first time I went to the, um, to serve, I was with, I think it might have been with the Unitarian group. Anyway, one of the things that we do, they do, first of all, I think the uh, Unitarians make a, a, a huge gift. They provide a nice space. It's warm. Um, the breakfasts are good. They're wonderful, in fact. But the one of the I know one of the nights when he came back after he served, he was he was flabbergasted. First of all, that he was able to do it. But the fact that the tradition is to warm the plates. Oh. I mean, <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. That's you know, that's a five-star hotel routine, you know, and we're doing uh -huh. it there, and I think it's wonderful. Uh, um, you know, the, one of the things I, I think about oftentimes we we look at these things, we look at these kind of operations, these you know, providing food as charity. Well, I think it's also a matter of justice. Mm -hmm. You know, we have, we have been blessed um, by our families, opportunities, our whiteness, our, um, our cultural uh, advantages as families, as a community. We had safety. We had all these sorts of things. And because of our structures in our society, many of those people that come there have none of that. Mm -hmm. So I was reading the other day, and they were talking about, again, the preferential option for the poor. It was like this theologian made the comment, it was almost like 
These are Christ, the poor are Christ crucified. And if you really think about the social structures that these people don't have, didn't have advantage. I mean, the whole conversation, I have a, I have a, a grand, granddaughter, and I see the parents feeding her words and giving her experiences and all this sort of stuff. And I think of the hundreds of thousands of people that have none of that. Mm -hmm. And when they go to the first grade, they're disadvantaged from the get-go, and it just continues on. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, in a sense, these are, if you want to put it in radically Christian terms, this is Christ crucified walking the streets of Keen. Mm -hmm. They've been crucified by the lack of policies, social policies that, that make sense and benefit people. There is no preferential option for the poor. Mm -hmm. so Our options are cut for the wealthy it's very interesting. and those who have. The, the, you know, the uh, Catholic liberation theology that uh, yes. that Charlie's talking about, you know, that that in by the preferential option of the poor, he means that that God is stands on the side of the dispossessed, on the side of the poor, and although we are invited, you know, also to be part of the community, it's not the it, it the one that we own is the one that's distinct from the one that these people live. And, uh, and you know, in our uh, theology, there's a, you know, there's a basic belief in the inherent worth and dignity of everybody that we're, you know, we're called and challenged to uphold. Our, our language around Christ might be quite different mm -hmm. because, in fact, theology s separates each of us as individual churches, and yet who was more inviting? It was the fact that Christ was open to relationships with uh, the disadvantaged, mm -hmm. and it was the love of Christ that they felt that made that salvation for them. So the point that I have heard made several times here is that those who work with the breakfast program feel how wonderful it is to get to know the disadvantage that you're serving. But indeed, <clears throat> I'm thinking about a conversation I had with a fundamentalist preacher when he and I had a conference together uh, this past week. It was a wonderful uh, meeting we had, although our theology is very different. The language is different. I said to him, I feel as though I can talk to you because I feel you are a bridge to people who live on your side, to people who live your faith. You, you're a bridge that I can walk over. And I'm thinking about the people who are attending this breakfast and how they feel those who are serving the breakfast as more approachable, mm -hmm. that they're not so afraid of you as a successful person in the community, that um, they can get to know you as a person. Mm -hmm. And that makes it a way to walk across that divide and realize we're one with another as people. Yeah, I mean, to that point, I think the, the opposite side of, of being able to recognize the people um, when you've walked down to various places around Keene is that they, they have recognized um, uh, me, you know, yeah. and they've recognized us and, and, you know, and said, you know, hey, Dan, you know, or whatever else. And so, right. we, you know, there, there has been that human connection that was there. And, and that's, I think, a valuable part of it. And I think it's also interesting what you said, too, as far as, you know, Charlie, your characterization of, of, of that and, and the, the aspect of Christ crucified and that, um, you know, it's interesting as we talk about this as different churches and different mm -hmm. theologies, because I, I grew up in a, in a Methodist church. And so for me, I can very much, you know, what you just said there resonates with me. But yet I know people at our congregation who would run away screaming yes. from the characterization you just gave. But for them, they're equally glad to stand there. And, and because, and I think the ones who participate certainly in the, in the breakfast, et cetera, understand that at, it doesn't matter whether you call it, you know, the Christ crucified or whether you just say it's, it's somebody here or whether you think about it in some other context. At the end, these are people who need help in some way. They do. And and to your point, you know, we are certainly those of us sitting here. We have we are privileged in some way, 
that, and we may not have always been. You know, mm -hmm. we may have been at different points of our life where we too were there, but mm -hmm. you know, this is, in one level, our ability to act and to help those who are not at that level with us, you know, and to help them in some way. Uh -huh. Michael brought up the, the liberation theology. I want to, and this is, there's a, two terms they use. They talk about orthodoxy mm -hmm. and orthopraxis. Well, we're in the orthodoxy. Orthodoxy. We're not. We've got different um, dogmas and beliefs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we're talking about orthopraxis, the practice. Right. Yeah. That's right. And yeah. this is what. And this is what. And this is what the world needs. We need yeah. the practice. We do need the practice. <laughs> and we need even that the, even practice. Even, practice. even 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 Islam, mm -hmm. fantastic. Uh, takers of uh, giving to the poor. Yes, they huge. Very much you they know? share this. It the is an obligation, obligation. Yes. Yeah, for right. the people of Islam yeah. to give to the poor. So. And it isn't only the giving of funds, it is the giving of love and connection. Mm -hmm. mm. So it goes back to I think something Marcia said too about the, you know, not treating people as others, but I think of it as you know, so often when we see folks who are um, poor, disadvantaged, homeless, whatever you wish to, whatever term you should say, we turn away. Yeah. You know, we look, we look somewhere else. Or suspicion. Or, or suspicion, yeah. Yes. Let's cross over to the other side of the street or let's just look away. Let's not do something like that. And I think part of the effort, you know, um, with this is to help, um, help people not turn away, mm -hmm. you know, or to understand that. And it, you mentioned your granddaughter, and Reverend Michael said, my daughters came, and they're 5 and 12, and, and they mm -hmm. participated in that. And part of our interest, certainly, was to help them understand that while we may live in a house with food and with heat and everything else, there's a lot of people out there who don't. And I think, you know, the 5-year-old, not so much, but the 12-year-old certainly got an understanding uh, that there is something else mm -hmm. and, that, and that she is, at this point in her life, in a privileged position where she does have a place to sleep and food and and heat and all of those, and that, and that that's not true out of that, you know, out of the rest of the space on that. So I think there is that helping people get beyond the turning away. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't challenge or change your religious views at all. All it does is help you see that people who live differently or look differently or uh, pre pray differently are still human beings and we need to love one another in a deeper way. And in some ways, we're talking really about the church universal. The right? church you know, universal. That, that goes beyond our stone walls and your beautiful, you know, white clapboard edifice. Mm -hmm. That, that um, we sometimes talk, uh, uh, echoing one of our famous ministers, be ours a religion that, like sunshine, goes everywhere. And, and as a minister, I'm often talking about our lived religion that, mm -hmm. that you know, as, the, the, uh, 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 as it says in the, the letter of James, if faith without works is dead. And to me, faith without works isn't faith. You know, it's, it's a parlor game. So when we go out there and, you know, it, when I'm in the breakfast and sometimes I'm just coming in, hey, how you doing? And, yes. and uh, you know... Uh, Sometimes I'm handed a breakfast by the people, too. Uh, uh, it doesn't matter to me. If someone asks me, will you pray for me, or will you pray uh, uh, for, you know, that, that God delivers me, I, I don't give them a theology lesson or mm -hmm. say, well, this is where I'm coming from, man. Mm -hmm. I pray for them. I pray with them. Mm -hmm. I, I, I pray asking them for their relief, mm -hmm. just as I would if it was anyone from my congregation, just mm -hmm. as I would... Um, you know, that that's the, the lived part of it. Where does the food actually come from, Michael? Or anyone? Yeah. How, how can you answer that question? Well, in our case, I know um, we had some um, volunteers who took on bringing, you know, getting the food and doing that. And, and last year we had a very generous donation from somebody who, um, actually, interestingly, she was the sister of one of our of one of our members, mm -hmm. and, and she was actually Catholic, Catholic if I recall yep. correctly, mm -hmm. who, um, who said, well, what do you need? And, and so she sent a check every month to go and help fund some of the, the food that was brought in to that. 
So the donation came from a Catholic woman through the sister of the Unitarian uh, woman. Yes, yeah. yeah, the sister <laughs> of the Unitarian yeah. woman. That, but that itself is a wonderful right. way and then we for had, us to share. And we had other folks who donated um, money, donated food. Some of the volunteers, you know, would would go out and, and bring their own food or bring or something in. Sometimes people brought in extra. I mean, we had one guy who brought in sausages every so often. You know, when he was uh -huh. working that particular right. day, he'd bring in that, and somebody else brought in ham or whatever. So, right. and I think each of the churches gave a donation to right. help yeah. support the food buying, and I mean, we had the same thing. You know, that somebody would want to bring something special in <laughs> for a particular day, and that was lots of fun. If someone so was listening or watching this program, how would they know? how to participate or donate right. or do so or, the, or be part of this. Right. Some of the logistics I, I helped plan. Um, last year we figured out we did the breakfast from the third or fourth week in December through the beginning of April. And for that time, the cost to the church that was sponsoring a breakfast every week and putting it on was three hundred and fifty dollars. This year the 100 Night Shelter is going starting in, on December 1st, so we're asking the churches to add an extra month, basically. Uh -huh. mm. So for a church or a civic organization that wants to sponsor a day, it's $450 for the whole winter. Mm. So we're talking, what, $2,300 that it will feed 30 to 35 homeless people for 18 weeks mm -hmm. altogether, the whole, the whole program. So each church this year will be contributing $450 per day that they're sponsoring for the whole winter. Mm -hmm. And then they will also, of course, be required to put a team together that will actually do this, the good work itself. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think there's a bigger piece to your question. Mm -hmm. That's what because we Because it's not really necessarily that they need to get involved in this particular program. They could, and mm -hmm. that'd be great. But it could be as simple as how they interact with the people around them. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, don't, like, look away from somebody. I know, for instance, um, when I was younger, my mother had cancer. And one mm -hmm. time I convinced her to go to a social outing because uh -huh. I thought it would be good for her. But what happened was her friends would come up and say, oh, hi, how are you doing? And then they'd go someplace else and sit down. Right. And it broke Distance. my heart. Yes. They didn't it's, know what to say or what right, to do. Right, or they didn't want to see their own, you know, death in the future. Yeah. They didn't want to look at that, the hard pieces. What I think we can do is we can challenge people to reach out to each other regardless of who the other is mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and be friendly, be caring. Mm -hmm. And I think... The, you know, the reality is that I've certainly had my eyes open through participating last year to the extent of the need within this region. You know, here we are in Keene, New Hampshire, an ad hoc region. Mm -hmm. You know, the need is great. Now, you know, people can certainly participate in these breakfasts and these programs, and I guess I would say that probably, uh, speaking for our, our congregation, as if you were a member of our congregation or interested, it would be through our social action group and basically coming in and... and and coming and asking in our church about how to be involved. But there, there's other programs, too. There's the community kitchen. They're always yes. looking for volunteers. There's, there's other acting, you know, groups that are doing this. I think the, the larger point to Marcia's question is to, to open your eyes, to pledge to not turn away, to mm -hmm. look at what else is going on out there and, and see how it can be helped. You know, there's, we're just looking at how do we, how do we help feed somebody. There's programs that are operating in here for help with clothing. There's Habitat for Humanity working with housing kind mm -hmm. of issues. There's a lot of, in this larger picture of how do we help the folks who need it at this level. Mm -hmm. and, and, and some people are insulted by the word poor. They yes. don't want to be seen as poor. They want to be seen as human beings. Mm -hmm. And sometimes in our conversation, the, the way we speak about that is protecting ourselves and thinking uh, these people are other right. when in fact we want to look at their humanity. And it could also be said that, you know, um, by not engaging with people who are um, victimized or disenfranchised by economic inequality, we're impoverishing ourselves. We're making ourselves poor. Mm. Uh, who, who, who do look away, who don't mm -hmm. uh, involve. And, and as much as I love, I mean, I'm a minister and all, I, I love the fact that we're talking about higher purposes here.
but the poor are hungry every day. And right now we have a program for breakfast from December 1st to April 3rd that is funded for five of the six <clears throat> days that we need, uh, along with the community kitchen who does a, a brunch mm -hmm. on Sunday. Right now we have five of the six days where these, pe these folks will, will be fed. And by our service, we too will be fed. It would be great to have somebody want to step in and take that other day. So mm -hmm. we know, you know, the, uh, Jesus said, the poor will always be among you. And they will as long as we're in ignoring them. They need practical religion too. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven days of being warm and, and being able to eat uh, during the coldest months of, mm -hmm. of, a, of a country that can be rather cruel uh, in, its, in its weather. So to get totally tactical, you, we should say to anybody listening, that this is looking for Saturday at this yes, point. Because we, we have Monday looking. through Friday are covered by our churches here. Mm -hmm. Sunday is the community kitchen. So really, if there's somebody out there watching who's got a, it could be another church, it could be another nonprofit group, another yeah. organization. Civic organization. Civic mm -hmm. organization who wants to come in and, and provide that service on uh, Saturday mornings. It's 7 to 8. I think we all usually got there around 6 to get things going or earlier. And, um, but if there is a group, that would be, you know, they should talk to. They should talk to me, at least to get started. Um, uh -huh. And I'll put them in touch with the folks that are actually doing the training for how the breakfast runs, mm -hmm. any peculiarities about our kitchen, how to warm those plates, uh, um, mm -hmm. all, all, of the, uh, all of those things. And, and this year, you know, it's a great interfaith effort. But one of the things that I noticed last year is there, uh, I'm hoping to... Uh, to staff it a little bit more and to ask some of my uh, clergy uh, colleagues um, mm -hmm. to, to, to be there if there is pa pastoral care or social service needs that may be beyond the can of the, of the volunteers yes. uh, that are making breakfast and, and being neighborly. So yes. I'm hoping that we will, uh, as far as clergy, support our lay people a little bit more and better now that we've seen a need uh, yes. arising there. We had a few of those cases last year. Charlie, you said that you represent several organizations. Can you tell us um, if a person who is listening and watching is uh, Catholic, how or whom would they talk to if they wanted to help? Well, <clears throat> first of all, I don't really, I only represent myself. Yes, which I don't mean only, but I represent myself. Yes. Uh, but there are other organizations, the Knights of Columbus, which is a paternal organization, mm -hmm. uh, has part of their bylaws is works of charity. And they, they raise money. They, a lot of the money goes to St. Vincent de Paul, which is a food pantry run out of St. Bernard's um, mm -hmm. church basement. It's a very old organization, and it does a lot of good. And it's for not just, it's not Catholic oriented. It's for anybody mm -hmm. that's, you know, Anyone uh, in need. Yes, <clears throat> anybody in the community. Three nights a week, they're open mm -hmm. for an hour. And uh, so th that, that's the main organization that has, that has uh, they took on the responsibility. They put on breakfasts. They know how to deal with breakfasts. And so they were a natural, and they took it on with great delight and joy and, and were uh, greatly impressed mm -hmm. uh, with, first of all, the way the Unitarians what they provided, and also the people, how they responded to them. And this is, I mean, this is a new experience for them. I mean, they, they don't rush, rush shoulders ordinarily, many of them don't, with, these, with, with the poor, with the people that so obviously are wounded, mm -hmm. you know? Yes. And, and uh, we, you know, we shy away from those wounds. And, you know, and, and as Paul says, we're, we're to bear one another's burdens. Yes. And this is a chance, and I think they, this is kind of a window for these men and women. There's there's wives there that, to, that of, the, of the men that involved see this is a this is an opening to another part of the world, and so they they, they see it and they're sympathetic with it, and, and it's a it's a growth thing for them. It's a mm -hmm. and the, it's a bridge building that 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 bridge need. is back yes. again. Yes, and it's very important. A bridge and, building. Yeah. For us to realize here in Keene, there are many need, many in need. And um, so we have about nine minutes left, Michael. So um, 
Is there any point that has not been brought up that you want to be sure to cover today? No, but I, I was thinking a little bit as we, as we end um, that great focus about interfaith action, interfaith collegiality, uh, our bonding around our so many common uh, values, interests, principles, and, and ways of being in the world, the, the, our best selves. Hmm. The, the best selves that we want to be, you know, and 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 um, one of the ways that we do that that, that wasn't brought up because we we're talking about involvement is uh, all of the churches in town, or many of them from the Keene Interfaith Clergy Association, contribute to something called the Mana Fund, which is a, which is a way in which uh, people that are struggling with various um, uh, financial uh, uh, troubles, you know needing gas uh, fuel assistance or mm -hmm. or other other things um, we contribute to that fund and if someone comes to us we give them a, a card to go down to Catholic charities and and uh, sister Kathleen from from Catholic charities mm -hmm. manages that fund and gets different donations that are many of them are in kind uh, rather than than cash which could yes. be enabling people um, but that's that's a way that 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 our folks and and the people that we serve at the breakfast, and the people that we meet on the street, and the people from uh, who have no religious affiliation, mm -hmm. they can they can get some assistance. Um, that's also another interfaith uh, underpinning to the social structure here in Keene. We, we want to be clear that these uh, religious contributions are not limited to people who have shared that particular theological point of view. Oh, They're yeah. here yeah. being fed both spiritually and, and figuratively, but you don't have to check in no, to be sure that... There's absolutely no religious task. No religious connotation. It's just no. there, you know, right. they, they need a meal. And, and we saw people last year who were there, you know, we saw people who were there the whole time. Yes. You know, who were, you know, and we saw people there who came for a couple times, and then they were gone. Some people were there for a bit, and then they were, mm -hmm. and they would, they would, could come back. Um, some people we got to know really well. Oh, hey, how you doing? You know, and, and yeah. or where's so and so? Why isn't he here? Mm -hmm. um, but there were others who just came through for a couple of weeks. You know, whatever mm -hmm. they they were having some you know kind of thing going on from there. And. There are certainly uh, children involved in this. There were children, As a too. teacher in public schools, I certainly want to bring out the fact that there are children in need as well as adults, and sometimes they and, are also fed. And we had some children come, come there. We had families at different times. Um, another interesting aspect, to I think, was one of the things that was helpful was many people came, sometimes it was their first time getting connected to people who were involved with the social services of the region. Yes. And so sometimes, you know, they just heard there was a warm breakfast. But once they got there, they learned about the Mana Fund. Some of them learned about 100 Nights. They learned about other things or ways to help. So it was, Other resources. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I just had a, a fascinating conversation with Linda Rubin from Healthy Manadnock. And, mm -hmm. and one of the things that she said was that economic inequities are the number one health issue. Mm. Yes. You know, that's the number one cause of health issues of, among our people. Mm -hmm. And so, and that includes the, our, our children, it includes the, the different disenfranchised folks that we've been talking about. And, but it's, it's a core concern, a core, it's, it's at the root of a lot of health issues, it's at the root of a lot of uh, unemployment issues, it's at the mm -hmm. root of a lot of incarceration issues, it's at the root of a, a lot of, um, uh, you know, unemployment and, and, and so many things in, in the end come back to this. And so as we're doing this service program, uh, I hope and, and expect that our churches, I know they are, involved at the larger causes and, and trying to, to, to make systemic change as well yes. as, as a, acute need service. That's a, a really important point, however we participate. And anyone watching or listening to this program would connect with any of these organizations in order to then find other resources as well. It's really the acting out that we care for one another.
So I thank all of you for coming today. It really has been a very nice opportunity to share how people of different faith perspectives can come together because we are our community. We certainly are our community and need to work together to serve the needs of those who are in need, both spiritually and figuratively. So I thank you for being a part and listening and watching us today. And I thank all of you for being with us as well and sharing these ideas with the people in our community. I hope to be with you again soon in the future, talking about other experiences in which our faith communities are working together to serve the community of the Monadnock region. Thank you for being with us today. Is it living in temples and shrines? Does it shine down from the heavens? Does it well up from the planet, reach out from inside? Where does sacred